uh, but you should be able to see a, a map of the little corner of Northumberland that we that Bamborough is in. If you went about two page uh, widths north, you'd reach Berwick, and about 70 kilometers to the south of Bamborough uh, is Newcastle. So basically, Bamborough is a little village on the northeast coast of Northumberland. Uh, obviously, it's been occupied uh, as a site for a considerable period of time. Uh, it's dominated by its castle, which sits on a, on a natural outcrop of bedrock uh, right on the coast. Uh, there's the, the nearby village, uh, which goes back to at least early medieval times, probably into prehistory, though we don't have any direct archaeological evidence for that. Uh, St. Aidan's Church in the village, the earliest fabric is around the 12th century, but it seems almost certain that it's the site of the of the church mentioned in Bede, uh, founded um, by St. Aidan in the 7th century. So it, it, it has some real antiquity to it. The castle itself uh, is just perfectly sited. It dominates the land and the sea, uh, and it's a really good size for, 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 for putting a number of buildings on, but it's not so big that it's not defensible. Um, so not surprisingly, it's been one of the, the, the principal sort of central places in the landscape uh, for many generations. Our earliest radiocarbon date will push the occupation back to the very late Bronze Age. And right at the end of our West Ward excavations last year, uh, we uncovered a roundhouse, which I think is more likely to be Romano-British than prehistoric. But again, it's, it's a, a really nice feature that gives us a sense of real continuity. Um, the burial ground that I'm talking about tonight is the first major excavation we ever did. Uh, we've done quite an extensive amount of ex excavation within the castle itself, mostly in the West Ward here, if you can see the cursor. Uh, but the burial ground uh, took priority initially because when we set up the research project, um, there had been reports from, from various archaeological inspections by Northumberland County Council uh, of human bone eroding uh, into this. You can see this area of a body of water, that's the bowl hole itself. Uh, and so the worry was that this, this cemetery site that had been recovered after a great storm in 1817 uh, had uncovered some kist burials, uh, was under active erosion. Uh, so one of our first priorities was to identify where the site exactly was uh, and whether or not we could uh, demonstrate if it was stable or not. Thankfully, uh, we were able to uh, identify it and it turns out it is actually stable but it had remarkable bone preservation. So we ended up teaming up with Durham University and Professor Charlotte Roberts uh, to do an evaluation of the site uh, because it was obviously it's quite rare in Northumberland with its, with its boulder clay subsoils to get good um, bone preservation. So it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity to get a, a representative sample uh, of early medieval burials. Uh, now the site, if you visit it today, uh, it's very incongruous. You would never think of it as an early medieval burial site. It's, it basically looks like a little picnic area uh, in the June field. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why it's so um, odd and it doesn't seem to fit into the, to the landscape is that the, unlike most of the rest of the landscape, the, the burial ground in terms of its general location has actually changed a lot uh, in the last few centuries. Uh, as you can see today, the, the, the castle itself sits on its rock, the burial ground is here, uh, and there's, there's this real great area of dune and marum grass that cuts it off from the tidal reach, which is the low and high tides. But uh, in terms of looking at the geography of the site and some evidence from the archaeology, uh, it seems that the coastline actually has altered a lot. Uh, and the burial ground in the, in the time when it was in use seems to have had a much more intimate association with the, the sea. In fact, we can guesstimate a high tide for the medieval and early medieval period, and it comes out as something like this. So it's no longer uh, a little isolated spot within a giant, uh, an area of dune field. It's actually a, a burial ground that sits on a plateau overlooking what would be a tidal beach immediately south of the site, which is one of the principal palaces of the Kingdom of Northumbria. Um, so it's changed enormously in terms of its, it, the way it's perceived in the landscape from today to comparing to when it was actually in use. Um, so if we zoom in a little bit, the, the, the dark blue outlines the actual trenches that we excavated, and it was basically done over a series of years. Um, the burial ground is in a, 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 a triple SI, uh, 
So we were only given license to open up a very limited area per season. Uh, so the, the burial plans, as you see them, are basically amalgamated together from a series of pretty much 10 years of excavation, starting in 97 with the evaluation and then full scale uh, season on season excavation work from uh, 2002 right through to 2007. Uh, and uh, we've been working on, on the post X for this for quite a while now. Uh, and um, I've, I've been emailing back and forth with Professor Roberts and, and Sam Lucy from Cambridge University. Uh, and it looks like our, our publication date, which is flipped a few times for the full report, will be this December coming. Uh, so we're going to have to get our skates on, though, though most of the chapters are, are, are advancing nicely. So uh, obviously, if anyone has any questions about um, the, the castle itself and how, how it directly relates to the cemetery, um, we can cover them later. But because we've, we're, we're time limited and there's probably a lot to say, I'm just going to go straight into describing the burial ground and the excavation uh, and the burials themselves. Uh, this is a plan showing uh, the outline of the excavations. We're, we're basically looking at a whole series of excavations that's 2002, three, four, this was 2006. And then when we knew we were going to do our final season, we actually went a little bit further south, opened up another area just to see how far the burials actually extended southwards down the coastline. Um, and basically, if you if you if you you can locate some limits to the cemetery site, so there's quite a steep hill slope here, which clearly couldn't contain burials. Um, we did actually have a trench further out towards the sea, which was completely blank. So we know it uh, as it slopes down towards the tidal reach in this area, it doesn't extend. There's a little inlet immediately to the north. So we can pretty much define limits to the cemetery on three sides, though we don't really know how far it goes southwards away from the castle. But if you extrapolate out into the area that we know is quite densely occupied with burials uh, and sort of do a quick calculation, we're probably looking at several hundred burials, perhaps 500 or more, perhaps between 500 and 1,000 burials just in the area of the cemetery we know to have been occupied. So it's not a small cemetery site, it's actually uh, quite heavily uh, occupied. Uh, and we do have uh, ideas at the moment playing around with phasing, which starts off with some of the shallower burials closer to the castle. And we, when we assume that the cemetery is infilled um, from the best areas and then southwards away as, it, as, the, as the burial ground effectively fills up. Um, as I said, the, it was first discovered in around 1817 after a huge storm blew away a whole, whole area of June field and, and uh, revealed some kissed burials. And you can see one of them here. Uh, you can see the outline of the grave with its, with its mottled fill. And you've got the, these um, stone slabs laid on side now, in the area of the cemetery excavation, we find about one in five of the burials has some element of, of these, these stone lintels placed around the grave cut. None of them are fully outlined in stone, and we've never seen a, a covering slab, though I think the original antiquarian report from about the 1820s does mention that. Um, so it may be that's an erosion feature rather than it never existed. But we're not looking at the sort of burials we, we think of kiss burials from prehistory where they're completely outlined in stone. Um, perhaps the nearest and best example, it's been well excavated in, by modern archaeology, maybe Whithorn and Peter Hill referred to what he called lintel burials. Uh, and they had soil conditions that allowed some element of soil staining to be preserved uh, where wood had rotted. And he thought that the graves had been outlined in a mixture of timber and stone. So it's possible that that's the case in Bamba, but with our very free draining soil, we have we have very little in the way of organic material preservation just the bone itself which preserves extremely well uh it's very mixed cemetery site we have everything from extremely crouched burials that look positively prehistoric right through to a to absolutely standard high medieval west east full length burials we have a surprising number of burials which are flexed uh and equally a surprising number which are prone um, some degree of intercutting, which suggests that the cemetery has been, you know, very densely used at times, but also there clearly are periods when the burials have been laid out in very neat rows with, with a great deal of order. So it seems to be a cemetery that was in use for several generations, uh, and it, it encompasses a lot of different variations, which I'm assuming all had, had some purpose or, or reason behind them. 
that we're still really quite struggling to interpret at the moment. Um, there's very little in the way of grave goods. The, the bone preservation is excellent. Uh, we do have every now and then in the graves, everyday out, um, um, you know, items, you know, the belts, knives, buckles, the sort of things that people would have attached to their clothes, the odd brooch, the odd shroud pin, uh, and occasional little grooming items such as uh, combs and such like. But we, what we don't see are, is evidence of sort of princely burials where you, you're getting swords and armor and shields and spears and such like. Uh, when, when there are occasional grave goods, they seem to be very much personal items. So when we're not looking at uh, a sort of uh, Sutton Hoo's princely burial phase of excavation, which is one of the clues I think that first started to, realize, to, to suggest that we're looking mostly at a, at a Christian era. Uh, and when the radiocarbon dates came back, uh, they overlap into the sixth century, but nothing in terms of finds um, suggests a particularly early date. And at the moment, I think Sam Lucy, having looked at all of the evidence together, including the radiocarbon dates, thinks we, we do actually have a, a final phase cemetery. So it's basically the, the, the earliest uh, Christian burials in the region, probably from around the middle of seventh century um, through to at least the eighth, perhaps going into the ninth century. But again, later burials, maybe further south where we've not excavated. So we are looking at, at certainly over a hundred years of burial uh, at, at, at the, within the site. Um, we do have, I, I think this, when this slide was put together, we were, we were saying 91. I think the very latest count we have for, for near complete skeletons, um, assessing all of the evidence is now pushed it up to around 94. Uh, but there's quite a bit of evidence of disturbance in that. So the actual num minimum number of individuals is well over 100. But we're looking at it, it, it uh, best part of, a, of 100 individual discrete burials. They are a reasonable mix, male to female, where, where the sex is discernible. Uh, and we also have 31% of non-adults, uh, which includes everything from neonates right through adolescents to, to young adults to elderly. So we are looking at what appears to be a full population with an ever so slight um, tilt towards male. Uh, and since we, we, we have come to associate the burial ground with the Royal Fortress at Bamburgh, it does, it, it's perhaps not surprising that there's a few more males than, than a genuinely balanced cemetery site. It, it is a, if it is associated with the Royal Palace, we always think of kings, their warriors and retinues. But if this is telling us anything, it's that um, that may be an element of it, but actually what we appear to be looking at are family groups. So we're, we're looking at quite a, a, a broad spectrum of, of what we think is the high, high echelons of society, but balanced family groups as well. Um, the health status and such like, um, they're, they're, they're big, they're robust, they're well fed. We have no indication of starvation whatsoever, but we, they, they do have all of the sort of diseases that we would expect. Uh, and one thing that uh, to, to well, Sarah Groves, our paleopathologist who did the, the main donkey work uh, at Durham University as a postdoc doctorate, uh, she, the thing that really struck her about the cemetery was the, the state of the teeth. Physically, they were, they, were, they were tall, they were robust, but they had the most appalling dentition. So really exceptionally high levels of dental disease, um, which we, we, we basically put down possibly to high living. Uh, we may be looking at the effects of, of a little bit too much red meat and too much mead, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, we don't have a great deal of physical trauma and such like, but we have osteoarthritis, diffuse idiopathic spongiform hyperostosis, gout in a couple of individuals, one of which was as young as 26, which again does suggest that perhaps they are living a little bit too high on the hog for their own good, and a couple of bits of evidence of weapon trauma. Uh, but mostly we're looking at the, the, the illnesses and diseases that people suffered within life rather than than um, warriors with injuries like that. Uh, and that shouldn't be surprised, even if it is a high state cemetery site, we are at the heart of the kingdom, not out on the periphery where combat is likely to have occurred. So we are probably looking at um, the population of, of the palace, the people who visit the palace, uh, who, who die there and who are buried in the cemetery site. Uh, the dental disease was absolutely awful. Uh, I mean, this, this is one of those slides where if you're of a nervous disposition, you probably should look away from. Um, there was a real, there's an awful lot of, of just general poor dental hygiene, calculus and such like, um, lots of tooth decay. 
Uh, the figure that always makes me cringe is 23% had of, of these individuals had abscesses. And when you consider some of them are, are, are basically newborn babies all the way through, it does suggest that the preponderance of abscesses amongst adults is terrifyingly high. Um, so when, when Sarah was saying that their, their teeth are just awful, uh, she's not kidding. Even the juveniles are affected to some degree with, with tooth decay and such like. So clearly um, something of their lifestyle has been very bad for their teeth. And we do have a couple of weapon traumas. Uh, so one of the, uh, the, the one that's really quite spectacular uh, was a young male, uh, late teens to very early 20s. Uh, it was a very shallow burial and the skull was missing, um, but, the, but the, 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 the shoulders were propped up at a little bit of an angle. Um, so we weren't entirely sure whether the fact that the, the, the skull may have eroded out of the burial ground. Uh, but one of the vertebrae that, would, uh, that should be there if the skull had eroded or, or been lifted was missing. And although there was no damage to the bone that said that this was a decapitation, Sarah thought that it was perhaps mildly more likely than not that we're looking at a, a, a body that had basically been put in the ground before without a head. Uh, and, but we, what is absolutely clear and unequivocal is all the way down the left-hand side of the skeleton from the shoulder all the way to the knee on that side, there's evidence of, of weapon trauma, which seems to be one blow with an incredibly sharp blade and a very powerful blow. The radius and the ulna are cut clean through, so the, 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 fo the lower forearm and hand are severed and are not in the burial in the grave. There's a, there's a slice taken out of the top of the, of the humerus, every rib all the way down the left-hand side, the top corner of the pelvis is sliced clean off and there's a little nick in the knee. And Sarah added all of these together as one continuous cut right down the body uh, and clearly fatal. Uh, so it, it's the one instance where we have no equivocation about what, what killed this individual. Uh, he died in a, in a combat, presumably uh, against someone wielding a sword and an ax who really knew what they were doing. Uh, and it's one of those rare instances we have of, of knowing exactly how, how someone's life ended. A lot of information in terms of what people suffered from in life, but less so in terms of, of, of how they died. Uh, but that's certainly a very spectacular indication of the, the, the dangers of weapons and such like. This is a couple of slides that show some of the damage. You can see here the, the, the honeycomb bone exposed. This is the, the, the ball joint in the shoulder, which is cut through. And obviously this is the pelvis on the left side. And that should have a nice little healthy loop here, but you can see that there's a straight cut clean through it. It's like it's, you know, it's been cut through by a buzzsaw. Uh, it's, it's, it's really frightening what, what we, these kind of weapons can do. Uh, uh, and it's, it's certainly one of the most dramatic uh, instances of, of being able to tell a story in terms of an individual from the cemetery site. Uh, and that, of course, would be, no, that's the, your normal uh, course of an excavation, you know, we, we recover the skeletons, we can measure their, their height and stature. Um, we know that they're robust, they're reasonably tall, even for, for by the early medieval standards. They, would, they, would, they wouldn't stand out particularly in the modern population. I think the, the women are, are every bit as tall or even taller as, as, as 20th century women. Uh, the men are slightly shorter than modern adults, but, but taller than your, your early medieval uh, norm. So they're physically very robust. Uh, as I said, we've got family groups, all ages, and, and lots of information on disease. Um, so we, we, we do already have quite a lot of information, but we were very fortunate in the timing of the excavation because when we undertook the work at the very beginning of this century, uh, there were some new scientific analysis techniques that were literally just starting to be applied to, to cemetery sites. And in fact, Paul Budd, who, uh, who did this, I think is his PhD, uh, looking as to whether or not, if you look at the isotopes preserved in teeth and bone, whether that will tell you something about the, the, the regions that people grew up. But that was a brand new technique. Um, so uh, Charlotte Roberts was very fortunate in that she got an AHRC grant uh, that included an, you know, the, the funding to basically look at every single skeleton that had teeth associated with it. We, we were able to do both strontium and oxygen analysis on. Uh, and the, the, the background to this, I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. Uh, it is obviously a very complicated science and we leave the, the clever bits to the geography department who are, who are doing the work. 
Uh, but basically, we're looking at strontium uh, and oxygen, uh, and it's from uh, the, the, the dentine of the tooth, so under the tooth enamel, uh, and the enamel of the tooth being the hardest substance in the body. It's, it basically seals the tooth in as a time capsule. Um, so you've got a very the lowest possible indication of any external contamination by looking at teeth. Uh, and what looking at the isotopes tells us is that our bodies are made up uh, from the food that we eat. So uh, the food you eat and the water you drink are absorbed within the body. Uh, and, uh, you know, in utero, as the baby develops, uh, it, it lays down little characteristics that tell us little geographical indicators of where the mother was during that period. And then also that you get, set, sometimes you get the adult teeth also laid down. So in some instances where we've got a mixture of, 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 of first and second teeth, we actually have two isotopic signature sets for one individual. Um, the strontium basically is a geographical marker. It comes from the bedrock. Soil is derived from eroded bedrock um, and crops grow on the soil. So the, the, the strontium ratios uh, of that particular geological area uh, get, get incorporated into grain and cereals. Uh, and food and you, we eat them and they get incorporated into our bones. The oxygen basically comes from water uh, that we drink. Uh, obviously, if you know about sort of ice core dating and climatic reconstruction, uh, they talk about uh, it, that's based on um, oxygen ratios within water. Temperature affects it. So it's basically a temperature gradient, uh, gives you an, an idea of, of how warm a part of, of, of the area was that you that the, the oxygen in the water comes from or how cold. So it, it gives us a, a very, very crude kind of X, Y plot as to, as to where the food that people ate and the water they drank uh, when the bone was laid down, uh, which is a very useful indicator. Uh, and also, we're very fortunate in an odd way that the British Isles have a remarkable variation of geology. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a map of the geological variation in the British Isles. Uh, and all of these different rock types have a different strontium isotope ratio signature. Um, so that gives us a, a, a great variety uh, within the British Isles. The other indicator of, of water is uh, again, again, that this is basically a temperature gradient. If you look on the European map, you can see blue at the top is cold and red is hot. Um, so basically the oxygen 16, 18 ratio is, is basically a temperature proxy. The British Isles, again, you've got um, cold here to, to warmer, uh, but because of the Gulf Stream, it's basically tilted over onto its side in the British Isles. So uh, it, it runs at an odd angle. But clearly, you know, the, um, the oxygen isotope ratios gives us an idea of different parts of the British Isles. And ultimately, also, if, if we find the, enough variation, different parts of Europe that people are potentially uh, coming from. Um, and in order to, to, to get, get a sort of uh, a base level, obviously, the cemetery site is based physically at Bamburgh. So the, the first assumption is that an awful lot of the burials are going to come from the, the immediate region. So as part of, of, the, of the work, um, Sarah actually took soil samples from various fields around the castle. Uh, we took proxies for, for, for modern, modern animals. We used snails, uh, mostly because they're, they're, they don't travel very far and they're very easy to catch. Uh, and we also included some archaeological animal teeth from the excavation within the cattle, castle site itself in order to give us uh, a really good, accurate idea of what the strontium signature for Bambra its village and immediate environs is. So we do have a very solid idea of what Bamber signature looks like uh, in strontium uh, isotope data. And we also took samples of water from the, the local streams and even one from the, the well in the castle to give us a, a very solid Bamber oxygen uh, data as well. Uh, now, this, this is a, a, a slightly confusing map. Uh, what we've got along the bottom axis is the oxygen data. Uh, each of these uh, little symbols is one of the of the burials that was analyzed. So this, this is basically a sample. Each sample is from a tooth uh, from the burial ground. Now, uh, these two dotted lines here, if they're showing up on people's computers, that's our oxygen window for Bamburgh. Uh, and this little line here gives us our strontium range for Bamburgh and the fields around. 
So where these two lines overlap, these small number of individuals here are the only individuals from Bambra uh, that are buried in the cemetery site. Everyone else is from either further afield in the British Isles or from even further away than that. So that was our first big surprise that we have a cemetery at Bambra that contains almost no Bambra locals within it. Uh, I think we have about seven that are Bamber in the immediate cornea of Northumberland in, our, in a group of 79 isotope, indiv isotope data individuals. Uh, and as you can see, that there's obviously there's a big spread in this general area, but there's lots of, there's lots of people in outliers. So it does suggest that we've got a reasonably cosmopolitan mix of people and where they're from. Um, and we have one or two individuals that are are really remarkably different. Um, this is mostly from the oxygen data. Obviously, different types of geology can reoccur in different parts of Europe. Um, so that's not as clear an indicator. But when it's at the temperature gradient, when it's the temperature proxy, obviously temperatures that are really quite hot, and when I mean hot, I mean sort of Mediterranean kind of hot, or very cold, they are clearly beyond the British Isles. So we're talking about Scandinavian um, temperatures. Um, so if we get if we get oxygen data that's really completely outside of the normal range for the British Isles, it's a very strong indicator uh, that we're looking at uh, people who are genuinely traveling um, from very far away. And in fact, we have a, a set of, of individuals whose isotope data is this exotic. Um, several of them are cold enough to have come from Scandinavia. Uh, these ones, are, uh, a lot of them, they seem to be crouched burials. And we also have a small group of oxygen temperatures that are really very hot. Uh, and I think the, the geology department said, we're, we're not, we don't mean sort of southern France hot. We're talking about the Greek islands, northern, um, northern um, sort of Libya area of hot. So that's, that's an extraordinary variation. Um, for the final publication in December, uh, Graham Pearson and his team in the Isotopes Lab at Durham are re-evaluating this, but the last bits of information I had from Charlotte uh, was that this seems to be holding up. Uh, some of the early indications when they got these very strange and very non-British Isles oxygen data, I think with the first two samples they ran four or five times consistently just to prove to themselves they weren't looking at some eccentric lab error. Uh, but it does, it does come back very consistently. Uh, and one thing that, that showed up when we started matching these slightly exotic um, oxygen signatures to the burial ground itself and looked at the actual graves of the individuals is that we have a little collection uh, in this central part of, I think it was the 2004 excavation, uh, where they're grouped together and more than 50% of them with this very uh, exotic high temperature oxygen signature are buried face down. Uh, now prone burial, it's one of those things that there are lots of theories about it. Uh, and it, I, I suspect it, it, it derives from quite a variation of reasons. Uh, but one of the more interesting expl uh, explanations that I read a, a little while ago was that um, someone came up with the idea that when you're looking at a Christian cemetery in the medieval period or early medieval, Prone burial may be the, an indication that someone is buried in a prostate state, so as if they were lying prostate in front of the altar. And it, they proposed the idea that it was someone who uh, was unknown as to whether they'd been confessed recently before burial. Um, so that's, that's an interesting take on it. And the fact that it, it seems to correlate reasonably well with these very exotic signatures um, is intriguing. And it does seem to suggest that we are looking at genuine data uh, and people are traveling from considerable distances to Bambra. Um, so obviously now that we have not just the, the physical information by examining the bones and seeing where we can identify tooth decay, disease and such like stature, um, sex, where it's dis determinable, we also now have um, scientific indications of where people originate from. Um, and so we, 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 one of the things that was done was to compare uh, the two together. So we're looking at Greater Northumberland and other regions here. And it seems that uh, uh, Mediterranean diet, Scandinavian diet, basically any diet or, or lifestyle that isn't from the Northeast of England seems to have been healthier in terms of our burial population. Uh, now, part of that is going to be bias. If people are traveling a long way to reach Bambra, uh, 
they were presumably reasonably fit when they set off. Whereas if you're relatively local, uh, that you you, know, you you may well be elderly or or ill. You're not being you're not selected for people who who are able to travel long distances, and then ultimately die from something. So perhaps there's a little bit of bias in that. But the differentiation seems to be quite consistent. Um, so it, it is interesting that it may be we're looking at, a, at, at health indicators from dietary variations in different regions and different countries. Uh, and again, the, this is um, health origins uh, and, and uh, indication of how, how different people are. And when we look at the, the non-UK, um, the, you know, the local people are, are, are clearly the unhealthy ones. The British Isles, the less unhealthy and the more exotic signatures, uh, the, the most healthy within the groups which again is, is another indication that the isotope data is telling us something about the distance that people are traveling uh, and it, it is a real distribution. So uh, that kind of leaves us with the, uh, the question of, you know, who are these people uh, and why are we getting all of these, these variations? Certainly, I, I think the, the extent to which the, the, the people buried in the burial ground don't appear to be from the region. Uh, we expected because it was Bamburgh to have a little bit of a few exotic people but the sheer numbers of people who are not from uh, our area, I think genuinely shocked us, uh, which gives us uh, the question is, is, you know, what is this cemetery? Who are these people? Uh, and why are they so different to what we expect? Now, uh, when you go and visit the cemetery itself and you stand on the site, um, there's a ridge of sandstone that extends from beneath the castle rock and that's down on your landward side. So you get from the cemetery site, you get really good views out to sea, and you can see very clearly back to the castle and very clearly back to the inner ward of the castle, uh, which we know from Bede's writing contained a church in which St. Oswald's relics were stored. Um, so we, from, from the earliest days, from just the physical relationship between the castle and the burial ground and its sight lines, and the fact that it's very cut off and isolated from the, the village that we, we know in some form existed in the early medieval period. It always made us think that we were looking at, at, a, at a cemetery site that is associated with the palace occupants, not the general community, which again, very clearly seems to fit in with what we now know of the, of the individuals from examining the skeletons. Uh, I mean, if you, if you, it's not quite on the high ground overlooking the sea, it's, it's on a plateau below the high ground overlooking the sea, but there's clearly still something a little bit of beer wolf and, you know, build me a barrow on the high ground about it. So we do think that it is a, a cemetery site directly associated with, with the castle itself, the fortress, and probably with the, uh, the, the chapel of St. Oswald, uh, where the relics are stored. And we know that, that, the, uh, that the relics made Bamber into something of a cult um, center and a pilgrimage site, uh, certainly in the later medieval and we, we're assuming in the medieval, in the early medieval period as well. Uh, so that, that was one of the reasons why we think that this is a very distinctive and different um, cemetery uh, group to, to, to your normal everyday medi early medieval cemetery. Um, they, they, they all seem to be distinctive in terms of diet. Uh, we think that one of the reasons why their teeth are so awful is that they're, they're, they're eating quite unhealthily uh, but probably from over rich eating rather than starvation, which we have no indicators for. Uh, again, their, their, their physical robustness, their, their general stature and everything we can tell about them uh, does suggest to the higher echelons of society. Um, some of the female burials actually have marks in the teeth where just tiny little indentations where we think that they're, they're habitually gripping thread with their teeth. And obviously we know as well that the embroidery uh, and textile working was 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 very commonly undertaken among aristocratic women. So that may be another indicator. And their, their physical strength and robustness, clearly some of them are all warriors from the from the, the royal court. Certainly the young individual who we have weapon trauma uh, and a clear indication of how they died does seem to link us with the kind of the, the, the highest status weapons, some form of pattern welded sword, something like that. So again and again, all of the physical indicators from the burial ground seem to bring us back to the palace site and the sort of people who lived in and visited uh, an early medieval palace or, or pilgrimage site. Um, so I think all of these things add up to make a picture uh, of, a, of, a, of a very distinctive group within society rather than a representative group of, of the general population. Uh, so I think that that very much 
uh, is the is the, is the indication that we currently have. Where we're struggling really, we, do, we I, I mentioned that we have a very great variation of how people are laid out within the graves. There is some correlation with prone burial and, and, and practices with some of these more exotic isotope data. But in general, the only trend that, that we, can, we can say about this is that as you go further south and the radiocarbon dates get a little bit later, you're much more likely to see your, your classic west-east on, the, on their back, uh, you know, arms to the side or across the chest. Uh, uh, burial that, that is what we recognize is, is a standard Christian burial from the, the later high medieval period and the earliest shallowest burials and we, we assume that they're shallow uh, because there have been various erosion events in the cemetery including during the lifetime of the cemetery and that these are some of the earliest burials and again they, these seem to in, uh, include some of the more flexed and exotic ways of laying some individual in a grave. So there's a general trend southwards and through time to a more conventional Christian layout. Uh, and at the moment, we're not able to say anything in more detail than that. Uh, I don't know, we, by the time we publish, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have been able to, to identify more about it. Uh, but we, we are trying to make patterns from this. But obviously we don't want to just end up making stuff up to fit as best we can. It's whether it's, it's consistent. Um, so uh, finally, to sort of sum up, um, who are these un un unusual individuals who are, who, are, who are mostly visitors to Bamber, not, not uh, regional locals? Well, it's an early medieval palace site, so you're going to expect a royal court and the sort of people you'll see in the royal court. Uh, so obviously you, you, we expect to see a warrior aristocracy. Uh, we would expect church uh, individual, people from the church, uh, to be present at court as well. But there are also the possibility uh, of economic migrants. Um, certainly in the Christian pre-Viking era, the fact that we have this group of people who I think six or seven who we can associate with, with isotope data that pushes them to Scandinavia. So what reason would uh, seventh, eighth century Scandinavians have for visiting uh, the Royal Palace site at Bambra? Uh, well, traders and e trade and economic migrants seems to be the most likely outcome. We also know from our, our excavations within the castle in the West Ward, uh, which is, is, is the lower lying area within the, the fortress perimeter, uh, that we have an industrial site that's in use right through the 7th and 8th century and into the 9th century. And we have evidence there of, of, of the manufacturing of, of arms and armor. We have un, unlinked chain mail. Um, Brian Hook Taylor, um, lucky fellow that he was right next to our main trench found two pattern welded swords and an axe in his first ever trial trench within the castle uh, and we also have um, a, a, a scramasac sword we even have beautifully decorated tiny fragments of gold that have uh, gotten lost and been trampled into the dirt in this industrial zone so we do seem to seem to have uh, craftspeople high status craftspeople making arms and armor uh, working metal and working even in, in gold uh, so that again is an indicator of the kind of people who are in the castle. If they're if they're in the fortress manufacturing arms and armor for the royal court, um, there may be a possibility. Well, certainly that they're they're eating from the royal um, uh, food rents. What we would suggest, and there's got to be a possibility that some of these individuals may make it into our cemetery site associated with the the palace in which they were working, because it's a cult center. Uh, that's, you know, that obviously has relics of, of Oswald, who was a very important saint in the, in the early medieval and medieval period, uh, being a royal a saint. Uh, I think we, we've got to factor in the idea that pilgrims are going to form part of the reason that people visit Bambra, uh, missionaries and such like. We, we know of Paulinus preaching uh, at Yevering, uh, and obviously Aidan was present at the royal court at times, preaching and such like. Uh, we also know from, from poetry and history that uh, hostages were, 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 were common uh, at royal courts. Um, those neighboring kingdoms that you had dealings with that you uh, are not dealing with on a, on a particularly trustworthy basis, you exchange hostages. Uh, it's a little bit anachronistic to our period, but it, the, the, the second sort of Viking age in the era of, of um, Ethelred the Unready, uh, when Spain and Ethelred exchanged hostages, they exchanged them in the hundreds and thousands, not just a, a small group of people. Um, so I, that may be a, a factor of who makes up a royal court 
Uh, we also have exiles. I mean, obviously, the story of Oswald Nosby and his brothers um, living in exile, uh, waiting for, for, you know, all growing up from children to, to adults in exile, waiting for their opportunity to try and reclaim their father's kingdom and their return to uh, Northumbria uh, and the successful reclamation of the kingdom. It does demonstrate that clearly the uh, royal courts would contain a number of exiles. Always useful to have an heir and a spare <clears throat> as a rival to, um, to one of your, your neighboring kingdoms just around that court. And just as a final note on that, which may indicate that the, we're seeing uh, these exiles uh, and, and the connection of uh, Oswald with uh, sort of uh, southwest Scotland and Iona. <clears throat> we know that Oswald was converted in exile and spent time at Iona. Obviously, that was the, the connection by which Aidan ended up at Northumbria um, as his bishop. But one of the burials that we found with a, a knife blade and a radiocarbon date that exactly overlap uh, in about the middle 7th century uh, turned out when the isotope data on the teeth was done uh, would be a perfect match for Iona and that little area of Scotland. <clears throat> so it may well be that we, we got an indication of someone who uh, was not a Northumbrian but perhaps returned as part of Oswald's retinue uh, in an attempt to reclaim the kingdom. Uh, and then lived out and the rest of his life in Northumbria at the Royal Court, eventually died at Bamber and made it into our, our burial ground. Um, so that's the sort of background, if, it's the sort of people we might expect at a palace site. And because uh, lots of you know, exiles, hostages, pilgrims, traders, craftspeople and, and, and various migrants are mobile, uh, that might be the, the real explanation as to why we have such a proportion of people at the cemetery site who are not locals, who are from the wider British Isles uh, and even from further afield. In terms of the, um, the few Mediterranean hot signatures that we've got, I think Christianity is the one factor that would clearly link Northumbria, that, you know, which we don't obviously think it's been quite an isolated place on the edge of, Northum of Europe at that time, right back to, to the heart of the Mediterranean. Uh, I mean, the, the, we do have a, a Greek Archbishop of Canterbury in the, in the late seventh century. So we know that those connections did exist within the church. And I'm sure um, that, that, that those unusual Mediterranean signatures must be related to Christianity, pilgrimage and such like. So that's the connection there, I think. Um, so really uh, sort of in, in closing, uh, we, 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 I should say that uh, obviously our, our website's available. We do a little blog. Um, I've not got it listed here, uh, but uh, there, there is a, a, a new uh, website which actually links uh, much of the data in detail with the, all of the skeletons. And it's, 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 if you look up Aiden and the, the Bamber Crypt, uh, you should be able to get a link to, to, the, to the website. It's lottery funded, and it's, that's one of the areas that's helping us fund our final publication for, for uh, the end of the year. Uh, uh, and so the, again, that's another little resource people might want to look in on, like you look up the Bamber burials, the Bamber bones, it should come up there with a Google search. Uh, um, and uh, basically that, that's uh, my talk for this evening.